Respite in downtown Pittsburgh. You're watching Experience thanks to the support of WQED's members, the Richard King Mellon Foundation, the Heinz Endowments, the Pittsburgh Foundation, the Allegheny Regional Asset District, the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, and Highmark. Thank you. This show is about Rick. That way is the West End Circle. And Rick Seaback, you know him. There you are. People just walk up to him and say, are you that guy that makes those TV shows? Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> He's Pittsburgh's storyteller. This is a story about some art that's on display year-round downtown. People do think, oh, he, he knows so much. Or, or they think I'm a historian. I'm not. I'm just a TV guy. Exactly 102 years ago today. That's Rick, just a TV guy from WQED who happens to do programs about the things we love. Ice cream, beaches, hot dogs. I, I'm like, you can't do a show on hot dogs. Who's going to watch a show on hot dogs? I thought, oh, he's crazy. I love hot dogs. The dogs here are extraordinary, and the french fries are legendary. I haven't seen that one in a while. Put your money in and you're on your mind. What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? I do remember just wanting to try them all. Rick is also the guy who produces those wonderful Pittsburgh programs. Every summer since 1899, People around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania have been Kennywood to Memories a park called Kennywood. Animals the South Side, slopes. the North Side. Things we've made, things that aren't there anymore, things that are still here. In everything that I do, my goal is to be surprised. I really think that it gets down to sort of like he it's almost like he's a local wherever he goes. They're little uh, slices into uh, humanity. It's real people telling their stories. And continue the Greek tradition of hot dogs. So we turn the table a little bit. This program is about Rick, his work, and how he has you, the viewer, watch, listen, and at the end, want more. This is very hard work. Any of his videos, you tune in and you get hooked. We asked his colleagues, his friends, and his fans, just like you, what makes Rick tick? What makes Rick kick? Wow, that's a good one. Mm. Okay, just so you know, this program is only a half hour long. So obviously, we're not able to include all of Rick's stories, and we apologize if we didn't get to your favorite, but we do hope you get What Makes Rick Tick. Um, people. People make Rick tick. I don't know that I, as a kid, knew that I wanted to be a TV producer, but what I do now certainly uh, fits the bill for what I thought I would be doing. From an early age, I guess I liked, you know, being the center of attention and, and performing and doing all that kind of stuff. Rick was born in Pittsburgh, grew up in Bethel Park, and graduated in 1971 from Bethel Park High School. Rick says his parents, Chuck and Peggy Seaback, were incredible influences. Both of my parents were from Hazelwood. They moved to Bethel Park, I think in 1949, right after they were married. And his mother, Peggy, was the first in her family to go to college, attending Carnegie Tech, now Carnegie Mellon University, on a scholarship. If I'm any good as a writer, it's because of my mom. And, you know, she, she was always careful about what we were writing. And I remember the first paper I brought home from first grade, it was marked fair. And my mother said, well, this can't be. You can't come home with something marked fair. It has to say good or excellent. People say I, I have a lot of food in my shows. That's probably from my father. My father was the enthusiastic eater. He was great at making breakfast on the weekends, and he, he always was, you know, a good cook. Rick has siblings, an older brother, Skip, who died of cancer in 1998. But while growing up, they were inseparable. I love this picture of my mom and Skip and Rick. That's me 
little kid. I, I probably am not even a year old there, but I, I love the, the quality of this photo. There's also younger sister Nisi and the baby Paul Kevin, PK for short. I don't think any of us were notorious with the possible exception of PK, but, <laughs> um, you know, we were just different. I was more of the, you know, crazy artsy fartsy type who wanted to read books and lounge around. All of us developed into, I think, strong, strong personalities. In school, Rick was a good student and active. Class plays, the forensic team, attending clubs, well, sometimes. I remember for a, for a very brief time, I was president of the French club, um, but I never went, so I got impeached. And I, it says that in my yearbook, impeached president of the French club, because uh, <laughs> I didn't do anything. Rick became a Francophile early while attending grade school at St. Valentine. A war bride taught them French. Mrs. Larkin, who was the mother of a kid in my class, Randy Larkin, she came and taught us French on Tuesday afternoons. In the second or third grade, we did a show for parents. I think there were two of us who delivered this poem. I had to say this line, and Mrs. Larkin encouraged me to be like wildly you know, hamish and to, to be an extravagant Frenchman and say, ah, que c'est joli au printemps. Oh, how beautiful it is in the spring. I think that if you can trace what I do to any one moment, it might be that. That may have been a defining moment, but there were others when Rick was at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'd sort of concentrated on television because I loved the professor who taught television. And so I had this urge to do television. I thought maybe children's television. Hello, 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 hello. We hope you like our show, hello. I got a great internship with Josie Carey in South Carolina. And we made a daily half hour program called Wee. Wee, 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 W-H-E-E-E -E -E exclamation point. The ideal beach activity, of course, is reading. Weekend. After college, Rick started full-time at SCETV, South Carolina Educational Television. Reading is magic. Like a magician, a reader transforms letters into words. He did public service announcements like this one on adult reading. Rick even created the animation. But gradually, Rick worked his way into the fun stuff. Rick used to volunteer to work with the programming department to do stories for, uh, I think it was a show called Carolina Journal. And so that's how he got started doing um, his documentaries. Buck Brinson was Rick's cameraman at SCETV. I think what Rick really likes to focus in on is the unusual and the quirky. Together they went to Australia to cover the Spoleto Festival for Performing Arts. We interviewed John Carlo Minotti, the artistic director of the whole deal, and we kept busy videotaping plays and performances. In addition to the documentary that we did, uh, Rick wanted to do another documentary as well, and he called that the... Slightly Wacky Aussie Daco. That's really an interesting program to look at if you've never seen it, because Rick appears in the program numerous times doing stand-ups, which uh, I don't think you'll ever see in any of his more uh, recent programs. This is an emu. This is a moment every crossword puzzle fan waits for, meeting an emu. Rick and Buck also made a film about the state dance of South Carolina. Somewhat like the jitterbug, this swing-type dance has endured despite many changes in dancing styles and trends. Folks in the Carolinas know and recognize this dance. They call it the shag. Shag helped Rick snag a job at WQED. I got this job by answering an ad in Broadcasting Magazine. When Rick got to WQED in 1987, he was asked to finish a program already in the works called The Three Rivers. Anyone who knows anything about Pittsburgh knows that it has three rivers. But Rick hated that title, so he changed it. We're calling this program The Mon, The Al, and The O. New medical research and breakthroughs in healthcare help transform the Steel City into what you might call the Transplant Town. His first complete project was called Transplant Town. It 
was really great. I got to interview Dr. Starzl and, you know, celebrate and meet various people, you know, from all different, I tried to find unusual ways of coming at organ transplants. Only thing that I did that was a little bit scary was I used only organ music in the show. Pittsburgh's international reputation as a From there, Rick produced one or two programs a year, always looking for the unusual, finding the wacky and wonderful in Pittsburgh's neighborhoods, buildings, history, and food. Look, T's an open rough maze. Okay, seven. yeah, because this is just. Kevin um, Conrad yeah, is Rick's of, editor now, and he's worked on every right. single one I of Rick's programs in oh, okay. one way or another. Yeah, there we go. Right. So just get rid of that. Yeah, that's good. Really good. <laughs> I'm not a Pittsburgh native, but everything I know about so Pittsburgh, I know from a Rick Seaback show. To get up and go. There it yeah. is. That's it. Just that little. Now thing. Kevin is learning yeah. something that's new that's again, amazing. where to find a great breakfast. I've always been a breakfast person. He and Rick are editing a breakfast special too. It's a sequel to Breakfast Special. Both are national programs for PBS. It's probably too long, but I like them all. <laughs> yeah. Rick started doing these PBS specials in 1996. The first were an ice cream show and sure things. Some of the people that he chooses to interview are people that other producers might totally ignore. I would take your help with anybody else that I should talk to. Okay. I mean, we'll talk to anybody who'll talk to us. If he goes into a restaurant, you know, he'll do the cooks, the waiters, the customers, you know, the guys paving the parking lot. He'll talk to anybody. Talking to anybody means just about everybody. Rick does a lot of interviews and shoots a lot of tape, sometimes as much as 100 hours per program. And it all gets whittled down to 60 minutes. So what'd you bring today? When we do these stories, not everybody makes the cut, but, you know, we take the creme de la creme. You know, the last time I Bob Lebomsky has been part of Rick's field crew for many years as well. I've, I've done the whole gamut with Rick. I've been the uh, lighting director, I've been the sound man, and now I'm usually the uh, videographer. We made sandwiches that you will like, I think about the year 2002 maybe. All of those programs have made Rick an expert of sorts. I love this, this is really a combination of my local shows and my national shows. He was just asked to judge the sandwich competition on Pittsburgh's north side, and Bob was there to shoot it. I love working with Bob. You know, Bob and I just sort of know what the others do, and you know, he wants some more B-roll, I want some more interview, we'll, we'll work it out. I know what he wants, and he, he, he wants the natural here? feel of the thing. Now it's mostly just the two of them, but the crew used to be bigger. In the old days, there were five people. Uh, generally, there was, there was Rick and an associate producer, a cameraman, a, a sound person, and a lighting person. And now, most times, it's three people. But when we do local stuff, it's usually just he and I or you know, whoever's shooting and Rick. But no matter, big crew, small crew, they always have a good time. You're getting these glimpses into places that you would never see and you probably never heard of. You know, it's not like we're going to these really big places. We go to these little places that, um, that I, I call them hidden treasures. And, and Rick, he's really a good researcher. That's the other thing. I mean, you've seen his office. All right. Let's do a quick tour of my office. This is where I store everything. Um, these two shelves are principally Pittsburgh books books about all different kinds of Pittsburgh history and all the Pittsburgh magazines that I wrote the back page for are there. <laughs> Here's a green weenie. Used to shake these at pirate games uh, back in the 60s. This is something I love. This is a little um, model home from Swift Homes. They used to be made out in Elizabeth, PA. And uh, we uh, did a story about them in houses around here. One local company that built thousands of suburban style houses in the 1950s and 60s was Swift Homes, later called Swift Industries, headquartered in Elizabeth, PA. This is a brick from the block house at Fort Pitt. Not an original Fort Pitt brick, but um, one, when they, one time when they were rehabbing it, we were down there, we did a story and they were throwing these bricks away and I grabbed one. And uh, then we have stuff like, uh, <laughs> this is a little teepee from the teepee motel in Kentucky when we went there on unusual building. 15 teepee rooms and one large teepee with motel office and gift shop 
all owned and operated by Ivan John since 1996. I have a little squeezy piece of coal from Consol Energy. And uh, this, this guy is, this is a bobblehead from Philippe's from sandwiches that you will like. We've heard Felipe, we've heard Felipe's, we've heard Phillips. Our concern is as long as you keep coming, we don't care what you call it. So little things that, you know, reminders of all the shows. I have a Mr. Rogers trolley, a Cub Scout neckerchief. Uh, oh, some people will recognize this guy. He's a, let's see if I can make him work. This is the, uh, oh, there, there he goes. This is from Mike Feinberg's in the strip, and he made a little cameo appearance in the strip show. It's noise activated, and Mike's daughter Marcia says they sell tons of these. Everybody makes a comment. It's gross, but then they buy one. <laughs> he, he writhes when he hears something in the office. Um, the rest of this is DVDs of Pittsburgh movies, a couple of promo items, lots of books from all the shows. These are mostly from our national shows. And in the back corner there, there is a tape vault of sorts with all the masters from my shows and some of the insert tapes. And Kevin Conrad sort of takes care of this back corner. Then over here uh, to the right, there are a lot of cardboard boxes. They used to be out in a storage room under the building and they took that space away from me and they brought these books in here and they just dumped them. And one day I will get around to cleaning that all up, but not today. This program is part of WQED's Pittsburgh History Series. The Pittsburgh History Series is why Pittsburgh loves Rick. Not just the people who live here, but those who've moved away, too. He captures uh, our memories in a way that, that make them very real uh, and something you can embrace. Fred Tiemann is the president of the Buell Foundation, which supports the Pittsburgh so that, History Series. That would be a, a great way to wrap things up. The Buell Foundation is Pittsburgh's oldest multi-purpose foundation. It was created in 1927 from the estate of Henry Buell, Jr. He gave his estate to form a foundation to uh, better the lives of people in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. Its endowment came from department store money in what was then Allegheny City, known as Boggs and Buell Department Store. From the late 18th to the early 20th century, Allegheny grew and prospered just across the river from Pittsburgh. And it was in old Allegheny City, now By the North Side, where the Buell Allegheny partnership started with Rick's North Side story. It had become a great place to live and work and shop. Historically, we've always had an interest in, a bit of a focus on the North Side. When this opportunity uh, was presented to the foundation, it had a lot of appeal to us. People missed the old city center and many of and the And plenty of appeal to viewers, too including the Boggs and Buell department store. My mom, Peggy Seaback, used to work there when she was a teenager. So Rick's work is at art near where the store at its purest. Uh, I think Rick Even markets the, the Pittsburgh gone, region so in a really unique and interesting way. Where was Boggs and Buell? Right around here somewhere. <laughs> he also has well, this odd little days, voice. Every day from April to late October, you'll find Gus Calaris in his little orange cart where he makes icy balls. I didn't set out to make them history programs. I set out to make interesting programs. But I always think it's interesting to know how things started. And so I did have history. Rick's documentaries, well, I think they're little uh, slices into uh, humanity, little peaks that uh, what uh, uh, regular people do day after day. Enjoying a hoagie and fries at Pepe's Diner in Wilkinsburg is Brian Butko. Brian is a writer and editor for the Senator John Hines History Center. He's written books about the Lincoln Highway, local diners, and many other joys of Pittsburgh. This is a very rare diner, a national brand diner. I think only one other exists up in New England. The stuff that Brian likes is the same stuff Rick likes, and that led to collaboration. Because well, way back uh, late 80s or 1990, uh, Rick gave me a call because he was doing a show called the Pennsylvania Road Show. Brian knows when to get off Route 30 to follow old sections of the Lincoln Highway. He knew of my interest in highways from some of the writing I had started to do. And he wanted to know a little bit about the Lincoln Highway. So we went out on a drive and uh, 
we just had so much fun, we went back out, did the same thing with the camera crew. Since then, Brian has been in several of Rick's programs. Uh, I think the fun of it is it's, he has an eye for what makes things distinctive, whether it's the architecture of a diner or a person who does something a little bit differently than everybody else. And I think it makes us all feel a little bit more special that um, maybe our job isn't so regular, that our life has some value and meaning that other people might be interested in too. And for the next half century, hundreds of cars per hour stopped to see the view of three states and seven counties. And, and I catch myself watching television with a big grin on my face because I love what he does and I love how he showcases the people that he meets. Deborah Ackland. Deborah Ackland is the president and CEO of WQED and she is a big Rick Seaback fan. Matter. I like you've ever been Kennywood, Kennywood memories a lot. You know that the best things you take with you when your parents force you to leave at the end of the night are memories. But things that aren't there anymore was the first building. one that I really I had my first went, wow. There. Everyone misses certain places and assorted pieces of the past. I would call Many it what he calls Pittsburgh it, which is a scrapbook like documentary. Park. I use that places because it was like putting fun. a scrapbook together. I love to find home movies. I love to find old pictures that people haven't seen for a long time or maybe have never seen. Okay, fellas. Deborah says she knows what makes Rick tick. We're going to uh, settle a couple of them down right away. He's just incredibly curious. And he has kind of a down-to-earth way that, that allows people to kind of reveal themselves to him. They were quite patient this morning. I love going to the Carnegie Library up to the Pennsylvania Department and just going through the stuff they have because if you look at anything long enough, it gets interesting. The county did truck in 36 buffalo in 1927 when the parks were brand new. That's what I look for, that moment of like, wow, I didn't know that. I don't understand how anybody could be from Pittsburgh and not be a Rick fan. Allison Rowland is a fan and she loves Rick's work so much, she started a blog, Everything Better Pittsburgh. It's almost kind of inspired by what Rick has been doing because it's looking closer at things or just kind of giving, you know, little daily reports from life in the city. And on Allison's blog, she's posted a Rick Seaback challenge to watch all of his Pittsburgh documentaries. I don't want just, don't just want to watch them passively, I want to watch them as an active participant. I take notes. I go and look things up while the documentary is on to like learn a little more. Allison, like Rick, grew up in Bethel Park and graduated from Bethel Park High School. Much later, of course, but still the influence. People get frustrated on walks with me because I'm always stopping and looking at things. Just getting a little closer to something on a wall or looking down. Um, it just makes me take notice of things more and ask more questions. I first discovered Rick uh, uh, while watching PBS. Emily Goodstein lives in Washington, D.C. She blogs about Rick on her wild and crazy pearl. And Emily likes to mimic Rick's style. Superdog is not a place to miss. Local Chicagoans have been eating here for years. Don't forget to get extra cheese and the waffle fries on your dog before you leave. Those super dogs on top of the building are known as Maury and Flory named for the couple who has owned and operated this place since 1948. A hot dog Morning. program is a national PBS show. It debuted in 1999. Every day I eat a hot dog. And I think it has to do with the, with the spicy, seasoned uh, taste. I feel like Rick is the epitome of the food tourism guru. He gets the inside story. It feels like he's a local where he doesn't really leave any authentic nuances unturned. Um, and I love the way that when he tells me about a food destination to visit, it feels like he really has lived in that city or attended that, that beach forever. So when I'm there, I can pretend I'm a local too. So that's good. For us Pittsburghers, you know, Vince can't get more local than Permani Brothers, okay? Alrighty. This place reminds me of Rick. We eat lunch here a lot. Capricorn. I like it when you get all of it together, but it's hard. You can only open your mouth so long. Manette Seat worked as Rick's associate producer for 10 years. She did all kinds of things, make travel reservations, try to make sure we could get a van big enough to get all of us and the crew and all of our equipment in if we were traveling out of town. <laughs> I've never had a cheesesteak. I always either get Capicola or bacon. Why do people talk to him so easily? He has that face. 
He is a draw two face. Kathy is an old friend. We tell each other's stories. She tells Rick's stories. Rick tells her stories. This place has been in a couple of Rick's shows. TLC. Kathy is Kathy Corradetti. She's making the sandwiches here. There's lunch. Kathy has been working at Permanis on the south side for... Oh, probably about 20 years. Yep. Rick's probably been coming here about that long. Hey, hon, you need ketchup or hot sauce or anything? What's his favorite sandwich to get when he's here? Ah, uh, kielbasa, egg and cheese on a hill. I know. From the very first time Minette <laughs> worked with Rick, she was impressed by his ease and openness with people. I think it's obvious how much he loves Pittsburgh and how much he'd rather hear a story from a real person walking down the street. Fred Weber is the head of the maintenance crews. And you got it. real people are what makes Rick school. tick. Talking now with them. It's hard to keep up in the old ride because, you know, there's not parts available. He really wants everything to be perfect. You know what? Do that little thing where he said, it's the get up and go or something. Yeah, that's the beginning of it. The get up and go. Yeah, it is. Maybe the yeah's good too. Okay. The get up and go, yeah. He wants everybody who has anything to do with a certain subject to have a voice. I put the Rothless Burger on my Facebook page one day. Eating with them. All of us probably have a few places in town uh, that we owe Rick for showing us. Under the bridge. And Learning from them. Everybody knows it's under the bridge. Whatever you make, it has a little bit of you in it. You know what I mean? His, his documentary style is its own kind of Pittsburgh unique character and he lets people shine. Well, my wife came home one day and she said I bought a shoe. And sharing their stories. I said, I didn't buy a pair of shoes, I bought a shoe. People love to say, Aren't you ever going to run out of stories? No. No, no, no. People will ask me, do, do you think you'll run out of ideas? That's impossible. Maybe that's what Rick makes Rick tick. It's like the inexhaustible mountain of stories that live in his brain, and he's just pulling them off one by one by one. I'm just lucky enough that I have a job that lets me do that. <laughs> I've had these dimples all my life. I, I don't know, you know, I've never known life without dimples. Did my dad have dimples? Did my mom have dimples? Um, I don't know where I got them. I remember that the nuns in grade school, they always said the same thing. They'd say, does your mother make you sleep on collar buttons? I mean, we had no idea what a collar button was, but apparently that was, they would think that you had to like push something in there to make dimples. You're watching Experience, thanks to the support of WQED's members, the Richard King Mellon Foundation, the Heinz Endowments, the Pittsburgh Foundation, the Allegheny Regional Asset District, the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, and Highmark. Thank you.